Uh, today we're going to talk about um, the role of the vasculature in traumatic brain injury. Uh, we have been doing um, traumatic brain injury research here at Wayne State University for uh, many years now. Uh, we have faculty interested in, in uh, sports related brain injury and uh, car accidents of course which are a major source of brain injury and, and many other closed head injuries. Uh, just to remind people uh, there are about 1.5 to 1.7 million people every year affected by traumatic brain injury in the United States alone. Uh, one can only imagine how many millions are affected around the world. So this is a, a very important topic, not to, obviously not just from the point of imaging, but we want to use imaging to better diagnose patients so that patients can be treated better. Uh, about 80% of that group is considered mild TBI and uh, mild traumatic brain injury is very difficult to detect sometimes. Uh, the general feeling is that about 50 percent of MTBI uh, can't be seen on any imaging modality. Well some of the work that I'm going to show you today is going to demonstrate that we're now finding somewhere around 10 to 20 percent of these otherwise occult findings uh, can be detected with some forms of MRI. And uh, that may not sound like a lot. If you take 20% of 1. of uh, 1.2 million, that's 240,000 people that we're now starting to see some effects for. From a practical point of view, that can have a huge impact um, for a person who's been hurt and, you know, they don't think quite properly, they can't focus as well, uh, they can't make a claim for workman's compensation, they can't make a claim for their insurance companies because nobody finds anything wrong with them. So people don't know if they're faking it or if it's real. And then of course there are those people with post-traumatic post stress disorder, uh, PTSD, uh, and again the same type of questions follow. So if we can develop that imaging technology so we're more sensitive to changes in the brain or damage in the brain, then of course you know this will be a very important finding. So I'd like to share a little bit of that with you today. Um, I, I don't expect this uh, presentation to be more than about uh, half an hour so let's get started. So there are about 1.5 to 1.7 million people affected every year by traumatic brain injury in the United States alone. One can only imagine how many millions of people are affected around the world. And one of the problems with conventional imaging even though the, the images you see here are quite beautiful, is that we often can't find any damage in patients who've had mild traumatic brain injury. And about 80% of that 1.5 million, or about 1.2 million people, are mild traumatic brain injury. Many of these people, if they've been in an accident, they have trouble focusing, they have attention problems, maybe they don't do so well at work. And if we have no means to detect what's wrong with them, Nobody knows if they're telling the truth or if they're faking what's happening. So it's important for us to develop the technology that we can actually see something wrong with these people. Um, in these images that we have here, the T1 and the T1 contrast images, uh, you can see beautiful contrast between the white matter, the gray matter, and the cerebral spinal fluid. If we use a contrast agent, we enhance all the blood vessels here, so it's possible to get gorgeous images of the vessels. The T2 images are usually used to look for changes in um, white matter or gray matter uh, that might be related to tumors or stroke or traumatic brain injury. And flare is another way to do the same thing, but it suppresses the pure water components in CSF and lets us just focus on the lesions themselves. But if this were a TBI case, the answer would be we don't find anything wrong. So we want to kind of look at how we can design things to do a better job. Um, this is just the front cover of a book we published in 1999. It's all about the, the technical aspects of MR. Um, this book has been quoted uh, in Science Citation Index by almost 2,000 papers in the last 10 years alone. Um, another work that we have been um, focusing on is susceptibility weighted imaging. It's a technique different than what I just showed you. Unlike these conventional methods, this technique is very sensitive to iron and 
you have a lot of unscreened iron and deoxyhemoglobin, so you can see venous blood vessels very well here. And you can also see iron in the form of microbleeds, so if you had shearing in traumatic brain injury, you would be able to see that. Uh, and, and a year ago, we published a book on this, and there's several chapters on traumatic brain injury here. Uh, it's also a good place to look. Now, one of the things that you can use SWI for is to study whether the brain is functioning or not properly and whether the blood flow to parts of the brain are, are sufficient or not. Now, the funny thing is, if you have two cups of coffee, not only will you get a little hyper, perhaps, but um, you will also have blood flow reduced to the brain by about 15 to 20 percent. And that reduction to the brain can actually be seen using this SWI technique. So here on the left-hand side, you can see beautiful veins. But if we focus on some of the smaller veins here, you can't see them very well. But notice after two cups of coffee that all these vessels look darker in this picture. This is an indication that the blood flow is reduced, that there's more deoxyhemoglobin present in these vessels. And although that's the amount that this has changed is okay for normal people, if this changes by too much, it's an indication of stroke or some local abnormality that takes place. So this is a wonderful technique for studying that. And here's a first example in today's slides of traumatic brain injury using this SWI technique. So here you can see a fairly large bleed, but actually for this individual, unfortunately, there are many, many micro bleeds that have taken place in the brain here. And many of these are invisible by conventional imaging, although these, the, the larger ones, like in this area and this area, they would be seen by normal imaging. But the scope or the extent of the damage might not be seen by conventional imaging. Well, here's an example for you with conventional CT imaging, and you can see some evidence of enhanced signal here in the CT scan. There might be uh, evidence of subarachnoid hemorrhage here. Uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, by the way, is a very bad prognosticator for outcome in, in uh, TBI. You don't want to have subarachnoid hemorrhage. And look at the difference between the CT scan and the SWI scan. Here you can see damage everywhere. You see frontal damage, lateral damage. These two areas that CT would indicate might have an increase in local iron or blood are clearly shown on the SWI scan. And that there's just no doubt this person has severe damage throughout the brain. Uh, again, here's an example with the conventional T1 image. Looks gorgeous. I can't find a problem there. Here's the flare data, also looks very good. Uh, it's not clear there's a problem here. But on the SWI, you can actually see not only many microbleeds here, you can also see blood in the ventricles itself, which has settled to the bottom here since the person is lying in the magnet, and that iron is heavier than, than the water that's in the CSF itself. So this intraventricular um, uh, blood is easily seen with SWI. Now here's a more interesting case. It's a young man who was um, in a motor vehicle accident. Um, we found damage here in the globus pallidus and the putamen. And this region right here is the edge of the hippocampus. And it turns out that this young person had short-term memory loss, more like somebody with dementia. And this may be because he bled inside the hippocampus. And that is then a very strong indicator. And ideally, what we would love to do with imaging is to be able to show that wherever we see damage, there, this correlates with the cognitive outcome. Now, I can't say that we're, we have that type of accuracy at the moment, but on occasion we do. Now, here's an example of another case with lots of normal imaging, flare, T2, T1, even diffusion-weighted imaging. And this was a soldier who had being in a struggle and knocked on the ground, hit his head. Um, he has not been doing well since then, but nobody believes him. And uh, hang on just a moment here. And so the problem was nobody believed that he had a problem. And now we can see if we look at the SWI images, you can clearly see that he has a bleed in the brainstem, and this may well be an indicator of his problems. Now, how accurate are these measurements? Well, we've done some animal studies where 
We use the Marmaru model to, um, we put a, a metal helmet on top of a rat. We hit the rat on the head then with a, a weight that's dropped from about two meters. Um, you can then see from SWI some potential regions of bleeding here. And if you look at the histology where we've done uh, pearl staining, uh, to look at the iron content, which is purple or blue here, you can see very nicely a tremendous correspondence to what we see on the SWI and what we see in the animals. So should you believe us when we say we see a problem? Absolutely. Now, the reason I showed you that case is because sometimes these bleeds are very subtle. So here's an example of somebody who had an accident from a motorcycle. The conventional imaging might hint that there's a small problem here. There's clearly a problem here on SWI. And there's another problem at the area of the septal veins where you have many small veins coming together to then drain out into the internal cerebral veins. And the veins have weaker wall than the arteries, so they get damaged more easily. So what we found is that we found a lot of areas of, of venous vascular damage that are, are generally not visible with other techniques. And here's the T1, even post-contrast, there's no indication that there's a problem. So we would say that this person had suffered vascular damage. Here's another example, two examples where you can see uh, a thrombus inside a medullary vein. And that's on the left side for one case and the right side for another case. Again, an indication there's a problem. If these are associated with perfusion deficits of the frontal white matter, it may explain a number of cognitive effects that we see people with MTBI have in practice. Um, here's another example uh, where we can actually uh, see some effects um, on the flare data where you have these abnormal bright areas. You can also see that in this region here. Sometimes if there's a major surface bleed, you, you will see this effect. So here we do see uh, some damage. Um, on the SWI, you can actually see the areas that the shearing took place. Very clearly, look at B particularly, a small bleed in C. And then up by this area that enhanced with flare, you can see many other bleeds associated with the edge of that region and even internal bleeding that were not visible on the flare scans. So the other thing we can do with SWI is we can start quantifying how much iron is present. So the image on the left is a nice radiological image showing where the veins are or where the bleeds might be. And on the right, the brightness of this image is an indicator for how much iron is present. So now we can start to quantify these effects. In fact, we started to look at this in stroke, for example. And if you think about TBI having all sorts of microbleeds, TBI is kind of like having multiple strokes when you have significant damage. And when you have a stroke, in this case you have a blockage of the MCA, and we do something called perfusion imaging, you can see that there's an increase in CBV in the area that's damaged and an increase in the time of arrival or mean transit time for the blood to get to that part of the brain. So people have not focused on doing this for TBI. They've done it for stroke for a long time, and we believe it's going to be very important to do this for, for um, TBI patients. Now, in order to demonstrate this effect, we then looked at the presence of iron or the presence of deoxyhemoglobin in stroke patients, and we measured that when the amount of oxygenated blood increases, and this is an increase in oxygenated blood, the patient gets better on the NIH stroke scale. And if the amount of deoxygenated blood, or in this case perfusion, decreases and deoxygenated blood increases, the patient gets worse. Well, this is pretty amazing. This means we're actually kind of predicting why these patients are not doing so well. So perfusion imaging offers a lot of possibility here to monitor the amount of oxygen that's getting to the tissue and whether, using SWI, the tissue is using that oxygen or not. So I just pause a moment here so you can read that. So I'm going to switch over to imaging aging a little bit because Aging also has a very similar effect to traumatic brain injury in the sense that there's a breakdown of the vascular system. And you know people are talking about 
you know, NFL players who've, you know, had multiple concussions, you know, do they have traumatic brain injury and do they develop dementia faster than normal people? Well, you could imagine that those patients I've shown you with all the microbleeds so far, um, if anyone had a chance to develop vascular problems earlier in, in age than normal people, they certainly do. And we don't really know yet because these people haven't been followed in time. You know, will they develop dementia much sooner than they would have otherwise, or maybe they never would have developed dementia. So these small microbleeds, we call these cognitive strokes. And here's an example of a patient who um, has multiple bleeds in the gray matter. These are representa representing cerebral amyloid angiopathy, which is a form of vascular dementia. And here's another example of a patient who came in at the beginning with mild cognitive impairment, maybe a microbleed here, definitely year two a microbleed here, and in year three, he now has many microbleeds. After three years, this patient became progressively demented. Now, I would not say this patient has Alzheimer's. I would say the patient has vascular dementia. So you can see it. some of it looks very similar to what we saw in traumatic brain injury. So let me skip ahead a little bit here. So if we use this new technology um, now, which we call SWIM, to quantify the iron content, you can see instead of dark regions showing the bleeding, we show them as bright. Bright because we can put an actual number associated with this. So all of these small circles here, they're all microbleeds on this patient. The, this region here that's bright is the globus pallidus, which has a naturally high iron content, so don't worry about that. We all rust as we get older, so you know we're going to have iron increases in parts of our brain. But these other areas are highly abnormal. Now, one of the important questions is, do these patients start getting better? Well, if we image this person a month later and these uh, bright areas started to diminish in size or even diminish in amplitude, not size, then you would be able to say they're getting better. On the other hand, if one of these microbleeds started to get brighter, so for example, this one got brighter and brighter, I could tell you that he kept bleeding, but conventional imaging would never be able to tell us that because it's too small. So uh, I'm going to skip that as well. Now I want to shift a little bit to another area that's used for traumatic brain injury called diffusion tensor imaging. These are really gorgeous data sets representing the white matter fiber tracts. And what people use DTI for is to look for disruption in the white matter fiber tracts. And also quantitative measurements of something we call fractional anisotropy. It uh, basically represents a measure that we can use to determine if there has been disruption locally within um, the tissue. And if, the, if this FA value gets um, too low, then we know this is abnormal. It means the tissue has more water content in it and there's something wrong inside the tissue. In the corpus callosum, for example, it has a very high value. In fact, these are some example FA images and you can see here very bright images, very high values. So this would be normal. And if I take the inversion of this, and you can see now it looks dark because I inverted it. And if this person had an abnormality in his FA value from TBI, you would see a white region inside this part of the corpus callosum. And this would be an indication that he had some damage in the corpus callosum. So practically speaking, um, we've been evaluating traumatic brain injury now for a number of sites around the world. We've done work with people in in uh, Vancouver, Canada. We've been working with a number of sites in the United States. Um, we're processing data from China. Um, so these people run our protocol. We give them a very specific MR protocol. We then do this quantitative processing for them. And in our first 62 patients from uh, Canada, we found that 11 of them show clear evidence for uh, traumatic brain injury. So the the ability to see more patients now with damage is, is clearly possible using these techniques. Um, I'm going to show you an example of another TBI case just to show you again how subtle this can be. This is from that group of 62. Um, you can see here two microbleeds. 
And here also, again, two microbleeds, very nicely shown. Here's the flare data, and you basically don't have any evidence of damage in flare. So a clear indication that there really was damage for this person. Um, here's another case, uh, again, showing you know, microbleeds here and in multiple locations, very small bleeds, but clearly bleeds, um, again, complementing the normal imaging. Um, we have multiple protocols that, that we use here. Sometimes we will do the perfusion scanning, not just SWI and DTI. Um, here's an example of a patient that has a pretty significant size hemorrhage, which is actually seen in the conventional imaging. Uh, it's seen here on T2, and it's seen, of course, much more clearly here. And there may actually be some other damage in this area as well. And I'm almost done here. Here's the same patient. If we go a little higher up in the brain, we found more microbleeds on this patient. So this is very important, sometimes from a legal perspective, because, you know, if a person is in an accident and they claim they're hurt and nobody finds anything wrong, it may be tough for you to win a case. But if you've got this type of clear data, then it becomes easier for you to, to do that. Uh, this is a particularly interesting case because it looks almost like it's out of a textbook. This is a blast case from a soldier who would unfortunately suffered blast and MTBI. And here you can see the whole structure of the draining veins all the way to the septal vein very clearly shown. And this does not show in conventional imaging. The conventional imaging does show a lower portion that has some tissue damage, but none of this other part that we have alluded to in SWI. Now, if you asked me if this person is probably suffering a perfusion deficit, I would say yes. I wish they had collected perfusion data here because it's very clear that this whole territory is very slow blood flow, and that's why they have highlighted on these images. Now, you've seen that already. I'm going to skip a few of these. It's a bit too many. I do want to point out to you there's an interesting paper that just came out it talks about the safety and efficacy of early pharmacological thromboprophylaxis in traumatic brain injury, uh, systematic review and meta-analysis. And basically what they find is that if you see this early on, within, say, the first 72 hours, that it may be worth treating patients to try to remove the presence of thrombus. And as you've seen in some of our examples, some of these people have thrombus. But I think generally they're not treated. So maybe down the road, we might be able to prove that this is the, a method by which we could monitor patients pre and post treatment and see that that treatment actually helped them. So if that thrombus isn't staying there your whole life, maybe you get perfusion back to that tissue, which would be very exciting. So in conclusion, I, what I tried to show you today is that we are making great progress in, in um, imaging mild traumatic brain injury that SWI and SWIM are two important techniques to use to complement diffusion tensor imaging. I think we need to be studying perfusion much more, and it's certainly something we're starting to do, and that maybe these studies will also help us improve treatment for TBI patients. So I'm going to stop there, and if you have any questions, um, which is one already, very good. So Lino Bacara, um, he asks about ASL and SWI. Well, most of what I showed you was SWI related. The perfusion images I showed you were using dynamic susceptibility contrast. So that's with a contrast agent. ASL can also be used to look at major changes in perfusion. It can be done without a contrast agent. The quality of ASL images is not particularly spectacular today, but they certainly can be used to look for major perfusion deficits. Uh, I hope that helps answer your question if that was what you were aiming at, Lionel. Um, any other questions? All right, well, I hope that's been helpful for you. Um, Emil, have you been putting the presentations on the, the website? So where, where can they find these presentations if they want to look at them in more detail? Uh, it's either we can post it on so, the or... So how about putting it here? So put it on the website, mrinnovations.com. Yeah. 
we can look at this right. more that too. Well, we can just send it all right. So if you want to go to mrinnovations.com, um, we will put the slides and the talks there so that you can have a chance to uh, review the data. Yes, we. that's a good question, Patrick. We actually have um, developed a, quite an extensive program called SPIN. It's called SPIN Software. And uh, using this software, you can... Uh, oh, sorry. His question is, is there a software comparing for comparing MIPS? Um, well, we have software that will let you compare MIPS, actually create MIPS, um, do more than what you're originally given by the data that comes out of the system. Uh, we have a complete set of software for this. Um, and if you're interested in that, again, you can go to mrinnovations.com. And uh, if you have many data sets, well, you can contact us. We also have usually a two to three day program for people who are researching in uh, traumatic brain injury or also in diseases like multiple sclerosis and other neurodegenerative diseases, where we uh, invite people to spend two or three days with us here. They meet about 10 or 15 of our people and they get a complete uh, review of the software here. Uh, yes, it's possible, of course. Uh, you know, if people are experiencing cognitive impairment, they should, their neurologist should probably have already recommended um, that they see somebody. The question was, could this be useful, useful for younger people without knowing TBI but who are having cognitive impairment? Absolutely, you should get a, a scan and, and although not everyone in the world does SWI and PWI today, um, you, you should definitely request this. Yes, we're showing the website for you right now. And uh, there, there's also another website that you can go to that has many talks on it already. Uh, and that is this site. They're not all related to TBI, but there's a lot of what we do in terms of imaging the vascular side of the brain there. Another question is, how long after mild injury can SWI detect a bleed if there was a minor bleed that occurred post-injury? Okay, an excellent question. Um, depending on how big the bleeds are, I might be able to see it five years later. Small bleeds and very diffuse bleeds, young people are able to clear this up pretty quickly, within a few months. But if you have a fairly major bleed, and major might only be three, four, five millimeters, it's hard for the macrophages to get in to the iron and remove it. So it tends to stay there, which means if you had an accident five years ago, I can probably tell you had an accident five years ago. Now, actually, you have talks here, right? Where, okay, you have TBI on here. Very good. Okay. Um, any other questions? Well, thank you very much, and also, if you, if you want to contact us, please feel free to uh, email us, and we'd be very happy to talk to you about any technical details, whether it's for an individual person you're worried about, um, or if it's to do a TBI study. Um, just to let you know, I just wrote a grant myself. It's a U01 grant to, to create a collaboration of 12 sites around the United States to collect 4,000 TBI cases. Well, whether or not we'll get that grant is another story, but we are trying to create a national collaboration to study these techniques. So if you're interested, please let us know. Thanks very much, everyone.